Fantastic. Thanks for adding in some of your reflections from this morning as well. Um, so we've had a couple of conversations um, leading up to this that have um, highlighted a couple things. Um, one in particular is that we find um, when we have conversations in separate arenas that we often use different language um, and that the communication gap often between research and the commercial sectors um, can create unintentional barriers. And so um, one is to make sure that this conversation is one that we um, uh, can fully immerse ourselves in, and so I'm kind of putting that out there as, as something that I've tried to become incredibly conscious of, because the biggest opportunity as well is you hear all of these different avenues that are setting a path for blue economy um, for Aotearoa. How do we keep them moving forward? And that takes us, as Eva said, into a very, very collaborative space in communication and trust are key to good collaboration. So. Um, what I might do is we've got a couple questions um, to work through, and then we'll cl click over to Slido. So if there's anything that you have as well as from earlier, for anybody in particular, add their name to it. Otherwise, we'll throw everything up to the whole panel. So um, you all get to work in kind of the cold face of this transition that we're talking about within the blue economy. Um, how do you see some of what we've been talking about today or even the principles that we've presented coming to life on that day-to-day -day level within either your businesses or within your customers. Do you want to start, Dean? I was afraid to say that. Um, <laughs> Thank God. I, I was actually at a, an event last night, and they said storytelling is important, and then um, uh, there's a, a poem to live it. So I came with a poem in case I couldn't answer the questions later on. So yeah, I've got that in my sleeve. Look, I think, um, I think it's quite exciting where we're at the moment. There seems to be a, a whole lot of things coming together. And the event that, that we're at last night, some, some of you may have been there, uh, the Aotearoa Circle was mentioned and they actually had Chapman Tripp present on a legal opinion, which is really looking at um, the, the, uh, the duties of directors to take into consideration uh, nature and biodiversity. And so, um, uh, you know, I think we're already challenged by trying to work out uh, 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 how to account for carbon and, and obviously trying to then measure and account for our impact on nature is, is a whole other level of complexity. So, um, but I think that's where our, our worlds are going to collide. It's going to be around uh, the, the need to be able to capture better data. Uh, that data is going to be crucial if we want to understand the impact we're having. Um, and so while we're probably coming from these things in, 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 in different directions, um, I can see that the, this whole area of the need to collaborate and uh, work on these issues together is, is absolutely vital. So um, you know, I like to sort of think of the work we do is, is really around um, trying to incentivise uh, impactful outcomes, you know, uh, and to do that, you need science, and, and, and you need the, and then it has to be principle-based as well. So, you know, look, I, I can see a lot of crossover from the conversations that I've been having. Um, I'm also a little bit daunted by the complexity uh, that is involved in trying to understand uh, how to uh, better measure and model some of these, some of these aspects. Yeah what he said. Um, no, I, I, I think that, um, I mean, we, Sea Lauder, we're, we're already in the blue economy, so we're, we're out there, we're out there fishing, and, and part of us is we can only catch so much, and so we have to convert as much as we possibly can into new value streams. So, for example, we're doing some work with AgriSea on some of our fish waste into a product that they can put onto farms to, for better soil stuff. So there's, what are we doing around the value chain? I think it's, it's a lot harder in the deep sea um, uh, space because it's a lot of the work that, as I said, is around inshore, but we are owned by Moana, who are in turn owned by Te Hukai Moana. And in, in Moana's um, field, uh, mangroves and planting of those and the biodiversity around that and the, the, uh, the inshore um, nurseries for, for, um, for snapper or the like is going to be really critical. And its question is how do you actually engage with one around that sort of thing, go, well, what is the value in that? Is there's, there's, there's carbon, so, but there's biodiversity credits, and I think the, the, the faster that the New Zealand economy government um, works the way around how biodiversity credits can be valued, 
um, is, is going to make a big difference in terms of how we get more involved in some of those, those insure type things, um, specifically around carbon. Yeah. Right, so um, it seems to me kind of being across two different worlds, uh, so one is the private sector and how the consultancies work and what our clients saying, and the other one is the research community and what uh, some of the insights and the messages that you are sharing today to me, everything that I'm dealing with at the moment and sort of observing that um, kind of unfolding seems like everyone is singing the same song, but at slightly different times. So it's not to say that we are, you know, our uh, pathways are totally going the opposite directions. It's not that. It's, it's the same thing. But, you know, the language is different. The terminologies are different. The acronyms are different. And there are some communication barriers here that we can just, first of all, sort of be aware that, you know, they are there and they're going to be there. But sort of, you know, all the players that are in this equation should really take active steps towards actually, you know, stepping out of their, um, like, specialty area and reaching out to those other sectors and wanting to understand them. So I know that the businesses, um, some of them will just have to, but the other ones will really want to be kind of leaders in uh, climate and nature-related aspects. So they are already, if you think of that, they are already stepping out of, from the kind of mainstream line of business, wanting to understand how they interact with climate and how they interact with nature. Um, so obviously this is something totally new to them. They haven't dealt with all sorts of like ecology-related things that we are so deeply passionate about. So I think that what we can do um, as a scientific community is do the same thing and meet them somewhere halfway through. So um, maybe, yeah, and this is what really kind of resonated today out of some of those sessions that um, uh, we've, we've listened this morning, that um, the academic publication shouldn't be the final goal, but it's just the beginning. And then how do we work with the um, knowledge that we have to make it accessible to those people so it's readily applicable into um, action and meaningful change. I really like the uh, collagen example um, of taking the starfish and having an end product at the end of it um, that had been commercialised because that was that actually that actually took the science and all the way through. I thought that was pretty awesome. And how do you do that? Yes, more absolutely. Frequently? And uh, with that one, I want to comment on something else that I observed. That this is something almost like this. This was really exciting for me because it wasn't just another economic opportunity, but it was approaching a problem from a totally different perspective and um, sort of. It's totally different from the business as usual way of doing uh, any sort of economic activity. So if you think of a standard way of how one might approach this, could be, oh, you know, there's a starfish, we don't need them, let's check them out. And like, you know, this is a hammer, this is the nail, and you have only one tool. But this project shows us that there are different ways of actually conceptualizing <laughs> it and approaching it from the very beginning. So you're looking at that starfish thinking, okay, we, we want it, we don't want it there, it's disturbing. But like, can we do something about it? Can we create more value that is beyond the economic uh, gain or uh, economic advantage, but actually move towards those you know, social kind of values and cultural values and <coughs> generating that true uh, impact across so many different uh, domains. So yeah, really love that. All right, I'm gonna try to combine one of the questions that we had talked about with one that's on here as well, which is, do you, are there certain things that you have looked to looked at either here in New Zealand or around the world where you've seen that science making that impact and reach into driving blue economy change in a commercial setting or in that investment framework? Or is that something that you feel might be what we're missing? Can you repeat the question? So I guess the question is, where is the visibility of what's possible in bringing research and knowledge into commercial arenas to drive this blue economy ambition. Are there exemplars out there here within New Zealand, within your own businesses, or overseas? Or is that something that's actually fundamentally missing from our conversations? Ooh. I might have a crack at it. Um, and and look, the examples I give you may not be in the blue economy, but I think they can sort of show how if we've got the science and the data uh, and, and the method measurement methodologies, then you can uh, then, then, I'm, I'm approaching it from a financing perspective, but I, I think um, you, you can actually um, construct um, uh, financing that 
is outcomes based. And, and look, probably the simplest one I can describe would be the World Bank had a, um, a, a bond transaction in, in Africa that was called a rhino bond. And, and it was called a rhino bond because uh, the, the investment went in to support um, a conservation project and the investor's return was dependent on restoration of the rhino population. So that's probably a reasonably simple thing to understand where you know, if, if, the, if the outcome is successful, then, then, then the investors get re rewarded for their investment. And if it's not, then, then they, they share in the, I suppose, the pain of that outcome. Um, uh, you, you can get more complex ones. We're seeing blue, uh, blue financing uh, by, uh, we had a recent uh, conversation with um, the Nordic Investment Bank in, uh, out of Scandinavia, where they were financing uh, uh, infrastructure, water infrastructure, which was really uh, aimed to prevent you know, um, pollution of, of the ocean. So, um, you know, that's again a re relatively simple sort of concept. And then you can go into much more complex uh, opportunities where, um, uh, in, in the social setting, um, I was involved in a social impact bond where the financing was to support an intervention around um, preventing uh, or, or reducing youth reoffending. Uh, so quite complex, took a, it was a pilot, and I, I'm a fan of pilots, which can test out innovation. Took a very innovative approach out of Canada, applied it in the New Zealand setting, and we're sort of coming to the end of that, of that, of that process, but it's been hugely successful. And from that, you collect data, and that data can actually help you work out, is this something that we can then uh, take forward and expand, or if it doesn't work, then I suppose you've got some learnings on why it didn't work. So perhaps I'd sort of suggest that there are opportunities to be innovative, but perhaps you started off in a small setting in a pilot and use that to to test your learnings and see whether uh, what you thought might be a good idea actually works. Mm. The only example I can think of is, and I can't remember, we're doing, I'm part of the ARTRL circle, we're doing a seafood sector adaptation strategy, thinking about where we're going to be around climate change and developing climate adaption pathway. So if this happens, this should happen, if this happens. So to try to address some of the things around snapper moving down the country and what does that mean around quota. But one of the examples that the guy who was running was in the, the transitioning um, uh, uh, fishermen in the in the islands from going fishing to actually growing seaweed so as a transition from the the fish aren't going to be there so you're going to find another income stream around that so i think there are other examples from small scale to large scale um yeah sorry i didn't think of a better i thought of a better example as you were talking oh actually. fantastic and, and it comes back to your question about biodiversity credits um and uh so the great barrier reef in australia there's there's been reef credits uh, established and what that was about was trying to <laughs> encourage um, uh, the catchment, the land catchment, uh, land owners to prevent sediment uh, runoff and and um, and uh, nitrogen runoff into the into the waterways that was impacting the reef, and uh, that was measured and then there was there was credits uh, delivered to those landowners who uh, prevented that runoff. So. Um, yeah, look, I think there are examples out there that we can learn from, um, uh, but again, it comes back to. The, the key seems to be you know, having the methodology and the data to support those developments. And I'll maybe summarize those uh, points. So like, yeah, my co-panelists did an excellent job providing actual examples. Um, how I see it is that um, it will be just really amazing if we could come up with some sort of way of encouraging or incentivizing that sort of behavior and those blue economy initiatives. So that will become a second norm that you, you know, no one will actually question you know, why we are doing it, but it will be just like, you know, a systemic change that will be so widespread and uh, we wouldn't need to think about singular examples here and there, but it will be just like yet another way of uh, doing the economy that will be our main mainstream way of doing marine economy. Right. I'm going to jump tech and read over here again, so apologize. I feel like I'm turning my back to you when I yeah, read yeah, the screen. Okay. Yeah. But, um, So this, it, it sort of builds up, and you've touched on it a little bit um, already, Dean, but says, how can we encourage investment in the ocean for the wider gains as well as traditional economic interns, returns, such as averted threat returns? So how do you encourage that investment in wider gains? What are those pull factors, I'm guessing, is... 
I think that there is um, there is a pool of capital, a growing pool of capital out there that wants to support um, um, you know, environmental um, sustainability. Um, and so, so, so I think that there, there is there is the funding there. Um, what, what's the incentive? I think you know clearly there's going to be um, commercial decisions around you know whether certain uh, projects and businesses are yeah you know, are commercially viable from a financing point of view. But the overlay we're we're seeing, and I think it's going to become more and more apparent, is that um, whether it's from a financing perspective or simply from a uh, from a uh, an access to, to market. So you know, if, we, if we're a large exporter and, and consumers globally are starting to look at the practices that are, are being deployed to to produce products. And so um, I, I see that is, is, is sort of, you know, the, the incentives are there, I think. Um, uh, and, you know, the, um, the direction of travel from all stakeholders is expecting that, um, you know, the, the, the the, the way that we um, uh, produce our products and the and the integrity of those products is going to be paramount. So um, yeah, I'm not sure if I answered the, answer the question mm -hmm. specifically, but I th but I do feel that uh, yeah. those things are starting to line up, and, and there's different stakeholders with different views, but um, I think they're pushing in the same direction. Yeah. To me, what um, I see kind of on the market and without kind of uh, sort of generalizing it too much, but there are two different types of how different organizations approach uh, the climate-related issues or the nature-related issues. And that's one is from the compliance side. So if we talk about those organizations or firms, uh, mm -hmm. these are the companies that are motivated by just the fact that they have to meet the legal requirements. So if that's the case, if that's the major driver, then this is something what the government can step in and actually uh, mandate um, the disclosures, for instance. So that was something what was uh, done last year and next year. Um, those uh, big institutions, it, it's over uh, 200, I think, in New Zealand, will have to um, disclose their um, risks and opportunities and impacts in the scenario analysis uh, against uh, climate. So um, that's one side of the equation. Uh, the other one is uh, working with those institutions that are proactively looking towards engaging in those uh, great kind of outcomes. So they want to demonstrate that they are leaders in this space. So how I see that is that um, organizations such as KPMG or the other kind of environmental consultancies can really you know, help those uh, organizations on that journey by uh, joining them in uh, helping them to define what is the strategic leadership even in, in that sort of uh, nature space or um, ocean space. Um, so there are those uh, two, two things that uh, I've observed. But the other one really is that, um, to me, when I've heard that statement was really shocking for me because if we think of um, that most of the um, kind of restoration activities, um, am I right that they are funded from the public uh, investment or the philanthropy? Correct me if I am wrong, but is this, is this the main source of uh, funding where it comes from? But actually about you know 90 something percent of capital in the world sits with the private sector. So that's a huge investment opportunity. So how do we tap into that pot of money to actually redirect the investment, even better, redirect the invest investment from the nature negative uh, activities towards those nature positive activities? It's really something what we should focus on because this is where the biggest impact sits. Uh, no, I, I agree. I mean, it's. Uh, I mean, the the bank the banks have got a massive role to play, to actually a perhaps lower their risk profiles to allow more riskier things to be funded, or incentivise. I'm having a get over here. Um, or, or give incentives, reasonable incentives in terms of interest rates to allow people to invest in things to enable that to be overcome, so that. Small organisations can take on those 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 bets equally. How do the small organisations work with bigger companies like Sea Lord or Sanford or Moana to actually make things happen, and and work out what the win-win is to actually um, benefit out of that? And you know whether it's biodiversity credits for 
for a Moana to be able to offset their carbon credits so they can be carbons, carbon zero, that, that, could be, that could be something of value. Um, that actually, if I'm going to build on your comment, because it segues into one of these here, is that do you feel confident as sustainability advisors or as a company, I would guess, um, to encourage your clients or companies to invest in restorative actions such as benthic restoration? We're talking about risk. Is it still too risky in your eyes, or would you be confident to start advising clients? Yeah, this is this is where we need to be going with investments. Mm. Yeah, I'm trying to kind of think of how do I want to start so I don't get lost halfway through. Um, Okay, so the immediately what came to my mind was uh, one of the uh, points that Sarah Seller made during her presentation that as much as we actually want uh, to be driven by, you know, the non-financial benefits from the restoration project because we know that this is the right thing to do. We know that it benefits our culture, our economies, sorry, not ec economies, financial, but our cultures, our societies, well-being, you know, just the fact that we can just walk on the beach, uh, enjoy the, the beautiful landscape and the scenery. Unfortunately, at this point in time, this doesn't seem to be enough to convince a lot of those uh, business as usual kind of companies that are still driven by the financial return. So I think that to us, this is a good, um, this is an opportunity really, because um, it's something what we can use as, a, as an entry point or as a trigger to work with those uh, companies to, towards achieving those more holistic kind of understanding of um, what's the kind of return from the investment. And as uh, one of the comments was, uh, uh, the question was asked after that session, can we start motivating those uh, clients or organizations with the reputational gain, uh, the, com yeah, the legal kind of um, costs maybe associated with that? So that's almost like a secondary line, but still like if we can make a business case uh, that there is a financial return from any of the restoration project that also provides all sorts of environmental benefits or social benefits, then to me that's almost like a win-win. But the other very important thing to enable that movement is if we can actually um, come up with sets of KPIs or measures, uh, whatever the terminology we want to kind of use in that context to actually understand what are the results from our restorative actions. And it's not just about, you know, what the success looks like, how do we succeed, but to give those organizations anything um, that will speak about what actually comes out of it, whether that's qualitative, whether that's the story, whether that, that's something alongside, uh, along, uh, along the lines of Tao, Maori, um, you know, stories and um, those uh, much uh, deeper uh, ways of explaining kind of wider context of social, cultural kind of setting. So if we can come up with something that we can present uh, to those, the, to the private sector, to the business community around those measures and um, from the restorative actions could be really powerful uh, in terms of moving towards the future and uh, shaping that future for uh, blue economy. Yeah, I think it's a really interesting question because um, uh, it's hard to generalize because it depends on, on the project and how big a project this is relative to the size of the, of the company and how much risk they're taking in terms of that one project. It probably comes back to my earlier point that I think there's uh, some real value in, in pilots, and I, and, I, and I sort of was thinking about uh, the example would be uh, Natahu uh, running their um, pilot on regenerative agriculture and actually making that data available and running sort of parallel farms side by side. And so that type of activity is, is really valuable because it provides information that others can then follow on from. Um, I don't necessarily think that uh, the, this type of activity is necessarily going to be uh, high risk in each case. And, and, and certainly I think what we're seeing is um, uh, you know, there's, there's certainly opportunities from, from the change that comes out from that. But often there's a, a transition period and, and that, that period may be where um, there, there's a need for some um, incentives possibly to be provided to, to help uh, transition from perhaps one land use change to another or one business change 
a type to another. So, yeah, it, it's it's sort of a there's some complexity in there, but I think um, I would say that uh, you know uh, there is some significant opportunity there as well. So I, I think it talked about the risk, uh, and, and we have to be conscious of that. But um, I think the opportunity is also uh, needs to be. Um, yeah, and I measured. think speaking of the risk, uh, also to add to your point, there's a risk of not taking action as well, which often yep. can be that uh, motivator, essentially, or being behind your competitors. Um, so this is, yeah, the risk of just not doing anything can be enough to actually mobilize. Yeah, I just want to add one thing. Um, so I had the privilege of going on a Cambridge University course on climate and sustainability and the like, and I walked away from it going, um, we all have to move really fast. We can't, we, can't, we can't slow down. You've got to move as fast as you possibly can and start to think about how you're going to transition your businesses or transition what we do to, to enable ourselves to be well set up for the future because it's coming at us and it's coming at us fast. And as humans, we, we, only, we only do it when it starts to impact on us versus before it does. And I think we've seen examples around the more too recently where it's starting to impact, climate's starting to impact us. You know, the, doing the power baseline, we've missed the opportunity to do that. We need, we need, to, we need to move fast, we need to move fast. Yeah. Um, we've got some really interesting questions all over, and, and everything from Rangatira Tonga, I didn't say that right, Rangatira Tonga, um, around global connectivity and positioning around financing roundtables. There's a whole lot of, um, of where, how do we start taking this forward kind of conversations. Um, one thing I'd, in, in order for any of, um, I shouldn't say any of, we've talked a lot about the collaboration, we've talked a lot about of opportunity, we've talked about de-risking. Where is the leadership going to come from, do you think, that's going to have the biggest impact on blue economy growth and transitions? Uh, this this group, yeah. <laughs> well, well, at the end of the at the end of the day, everyone sitting in this room are, are passionate about what they're doing, and you know, I'm, mm. you get I get overwhelmed by the the people that are talking to you about all the amazing stuff you do. It's it's all the people in this group, and mm. and groups like it to make sure that we are leading the way around changing what we're doing, and it's it's got a everyone's got a role to play, right? The the challenge we have, I think, within my observation would be there is lots of stuff going on in different areas. Uh, MPI are doing something and fisheries are doing something and the scientists doing something over here and how do we link it all in together I think is a big challenge. Singing one song at the same time. Exactly. Yeah, look, I think it's, uh, in a sense, it, it, it is happening. I mean, I, I think it's, um, it, it can be get lost. Um, perhaps the messaging doesn't get out, but when I, I was just sort of thinking, um, when I, I can remember uh, when we signed the um, free trade agreement with the EU, uh, one of the comments that uh, Damien O'Connor made was, look, uh, part of that agreement was really ensuring that there was a sustainability aspect to, to what they import. And his message was, you know, if we want to retain market access, then we need to you know, embrace that. And so, yeah, I think, you know, the way that I, that, that I think about this is this is this is a global mega trend that, that, that that's that's well and truly underway. Um, history tells us that you know businesses and economies that embrace these mega trends uh, and get on board tend to prosper, and those that don't, well, don't do so well. So I think, um, but when I think about it from from the New Zealand point of view, from a regulatory point of view, we there's been a number of regulatory settings that uh, have set a set a message and, uh, and a signal. I think that's been helpful. Um, I think there's clear consumer trends in place that are sending a, a supportive signal as well. I think from a, from a bank, you now obviously the banks are a mechanism for financing the economy and the signal we get from, from uh, investors who invest and provide us that funding globally is they're looking for us to, to make progress as well. So from what, where I sort of sit, um, you know, we're seeing uh, some very clear signals coming from all, all these different stakeholders to that, that we need to embrace this, and and, and I, I don't pretend for a moment this is easy because it's a, a big change. But I think um, uh, yeah, those signals are, are well and truly um, aligned, I believe. I think that if we if it, if it comes to actually thinking about a definition of leadership um, in the sustainability space, I think that we've 
long time, uh, not so long time ago, but like we've moved uh, beyond that leadership to be sustainable is no longer a good leadership. And that leadership will be, it, it's a continuously evolving <coughs> definition, but it's definitely gonna be in something that is more about generating the value beyond sustainability. So all the nature positive solutions, adding value to the ecosystems, not just depleting them or making uh, it equal. So, um, yeah, I think that what's um, kind of really encouraging and what can be our sort of entry point into building that sort of definition of the leadership with the organizations from the uh, perspective of the management consultancy um, is the task force on nature related disclosures. So um, this is something what can really uh, kind of stir some movement in, in, the, in this space and actually help those businesses to sort of start getting interested in that. And again, working with those early adopters um, can be really exciting because this is you know, a whole bunch of you know, uh, guys that are in high positions uh, in their organizations or board representatives or sitting at the ELTs um, who are really passionate about nature uh, or oceans. Uh, it just depends on what sort of their background is. But this is something what is really exciting from our perspective because if we can work with some organization like this, then we can really make that huge impact into shaping what that leadership uh, in the sustainability and also including nature, oceans, climate can really look like and it can start um, kind of getting that you know, more real shape. But everything at n right now, it's still a work in progress. So it's constantly evolving. We are um, having more information almost uh, from month to month, like more updates are released. So we are still kind of trying to get up to speed and be on that journey, but it, it is, um, this is how as well, like the power of collaboration comes uh, and becomes really kind of, uh, you know, powerful and really important because no one can, uh, you know, be a leader on their own anymore. So we really need to come together, initiate that dialogue, whether that's between private sector and science uh, or a wider kind of, uh, you know, bringing the governmental organizations, the NGOs together and work together towards defining that leadership in, in the complex kind of uh, world that we, we get to function. Thank you. Um, I know I, we're down into the red zone up here on the clock. Um, but I think that's a fantastic place for us to end with a real um, recognition, I guess, and a call, um, a call to action for all of us is that, that leadership as well and everything that we're doing through that challenge comes through the work that we all do on a day-to-day -day basis. And that the more that we collaborate, the bigger and the faster we can make that impact and drive the change that we're all after. Um, one of the things that I think comes with that and what I also want to acknowledge with our panel is that um, the first time I spoke with each of you, you all said, I don't know what I'm gonna add because I'm not a scientist. And sometimes it takes us getting outside of our comfort zone and becoming vulnerable and sharing our true you know, our true stories and what we're up to for us to start to build those connections and really catapult ourselves forward. So a huge thank you to our panelists. Um, and I think I'm passing it back over to Pai. I just want to acknowledge that I still consider myself a scientist by oh, background. So <laughs> this is where my heart is. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.